This is Sampling for Applied Research and Statistics, Chapter 8. I found this video and I'm going to play it and stop it throughout to give you detailed examples of the type of sampling that she's talking about. Sampling. Simple, convenience, systematic, cluster, and stratified. To find things out about a population of interest, it is common practice to take a sample. A sample is a selection of objects or observations taken from the population of interest. For example, a population might be all apples in an orchard at a given time. We wish to know how big the apples are. We can't measure all of them, so we take a sample of some of them and measure them. The method chosen for taking the sample depends on the nature of the population and the resources available in terms of time and money. The ideal is for each object in the population to be equally likely to be chosen as part of the sample. This is called an unbiased sample. And that is a type of probability sampling. I'm not so concerned that you know the difference between probability and non-probability, but that you do know the difference in the sampling methods and how to conduct that type of sample. It is also desirable for the sample to be representative of the population. If the population of apples were two-thirds red and one-third green, the sample should be similarly split. Note that no matter what we do, there will always be sampling error or variation due to sampling, as we are looking at a part of the population, not the whole population. And remember, that's what sampling is for. If we could uh, study the entire population, then we don't need to sample it. The video on variation covers these concepts more thoroughly. This video presents five methods of sampling. Simple random sampling, convenient sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling, and stratified sampling. For each method, we will outline the process and the advantages and disadvantages. Simple random sample. Simple random sampling is theoretically the ideal method of sampling. You list each member of the population and use random numbers to decide which objects are in the sample. Each object is equally likely to be selected. This produces an unbiased sample, which we hope is representative. However, it can be difficult and expensive to take a simple random sample when dealing with people. Simple random sampling is more practical when the population is geographically concentrated and when a good sampling frame exists. A sampling frame is a list of all the people or objects in the population of interest. Here is another um, definition of simple random sampling, and I'm going to give you some examples of a hypothesis and what we would use, how we would use that for simple random sampling. As she stated, it's a method of probability sampling that selects cases for a sample from the identified population by pure chance. The chance of any element or participant being selected is known prior to the selection. Therefore, it is a form of probability sampling. All of the elements within the sample are labeled or numbered, and the researcher randomly selects the elements to be included in the research sample. Just as she explained, you use a sampling frame. All the elements are equally exposed and incur the same chance at selection. Once the element is chosen, it can be set aside or added back to the sample for possible selection. Also, this type of sampling is best used for a small population and more advantageous for same thing. A study that examined a sample of a thousand out of a population of ten thousand would be very time consuming and not appropriate because you would have to have them all listed and a sampling frame that included this entire population. So the advantages of this sampling is that every element has equal selection possibilities, but it can include the time a researcher may have to spend labeling and choosing if you have such a large sample. So if you have a small sample, for instance, of a corporation of 20 or less, then you could, and you wanted to pull out 10% of the population, then you would put all of this 20 in a sampling frame and choose out two randomly. This, uh, I want you to 
remember what we did on the study on sex offenders. If you were conducting a study on sex offenders and your research question is does recidivism decrease following CBT programs for convicted sex offenders? There are a number of hypotheses that you could you could come up with. Here's four. So I want you to take a minute, write these down uh, because we're going to use them for every example of sampling. So recidivism is more likely to decrease for convicted sex offenders who successfully complete a CBT program than those who do not. The key words here are successfully complete. So in the scenario that I gave you, so here is the scenario that I gave you right here. Uh, commonly the public fears sexual offenders especially pedophiles. This fear increases when a known or registered sex offender moves into the neighborhood. Is this fear justified? In the community of Bear Trap, Minnesota, before a sexual offender is released from prison, regardless of the crime or the sentence, the offender must complete a cognitive-based behavioral therapy treatment program. Can recidivism be reduced? So let's go back to our question. Does recidivism decrease following CBT programs for convicted sex offenders? How about does recidivism decrease following successfully completing a CBT program? Over here, I said they must complete a cognitive-based behavioral pr treatment program, not that they successfully completed. There's a big difference when we're looking at cognitively based therapy. Um, research does show that if an offender successfully completes this type of program, that recidivism rates will be reduced. So we, we can look at does recidivism decrease following, does recidivism decrease uh, following an unsuccessful completion? Uh, how about does recidivism decrease for offenders who do not participate in a CBT program? So <clears throat> a couple uh, hypotheses. Recidivism is more likely to decrease for convicted sex offenders who successfully complete a CBT program than those who do not. Recidivism is more likely to increase for a second convicted sex offenders who do not successfully complete a CBT program. Those are very similar. Recidivism is more likely to increase for convicted sex offenders who do not participate in any CBT program than those who do participate. And recidivism is more likely to increase for convicted sex offenders who do participate than those who do participate and complete success successfully. There's another one we could add in here too. Um, that recidivism is more likely to increase for convicted sex offenders who do not participate in any program than those who do participate. Oh, I have that up here. Wait a minute. There it is. Right. Um, I have another one on my mind. So let's look at this in regards to uh, random sampling. How could we randomly choose uh, sex offenders? Now, sex offenders is our population. So if we had, where would we come up with our population and our sampling frame for sex offenders? Now remember, <clears throat> we did look at the community of Bear Trap, Minnesota. So if we were looking only at Bear Trap, Minnesota, and we wanted to do a random sample, if we could get a sampling frame of every sex offender released from their prison, that would be our sampling frame. And then if we could randomly select, now we already know that they have all completed a cognitive-based behavioral program, right? So if we randomly selected, let's say there's been a, a thousand that have been released over the last 10 years from prison, and we want to see how recidivism um, uh, the rates increase or decrease following their completion of the program. So of that thousand that were released, we randomly select a hundred. Now, it depends on what we want to do with that hundred. Now that we have our hundred, we have randomly selected them. We could do a survey of that hundred and asked who 
has successfully completed and see their recidivism rates, compare that to who did not successfully complete and recidivated. So there you have your random. Simple random sampling can be more easily implemented for natural and manufacturing populations. Convenient sample. Convenient sampling is just that, convenient. You ask people nearby or people who walk past at a shopping mall, or you take the next 20 objects off the production line. You do what is easy or convenient. Convenient samples are often biased in some way, but for a quick and cheap poll, it may not really matter. Convenient samples can also have self-selection bias when people choose to participate because they have an interest in the issue in question. Systematic sampling. With syst okay, before we go any farther, <clears throat> let's go back to here. Let's look again at um, our hypotheses. So if we're looking at uh, convenient sampling, I want you to take a minute and I want you to come up with your own example on how uh, you would do a convenient sampling. I'm going to post these questions on Blackboard and I want you to, as you're doing and listening to this, I want you to come up with your own. And that is what you will submit to me for work on Monday. So I want you to work on a random sample. How would you randomly, what would you randomly do to do a study with these hypotheses? Or you make up, may make up one of your own. Um, also do the convenience sampling example. Now I'm going to give you an example of a convenient sample. I might choose uh, those, kind of like what she said, I might stand watch the prison and pick 10 that are released who have completed a program and survey them. Um, I might uh, conveniently go into the prison and, or go to a parole officer. How about that? And see, talk with them about who do they have that had been paroled from a, uh, from that area. And I'm only looking at, um, I'm only looking at Bear Trap, Minnesota for this. So I'm only going to that, to that, maybe I go to one prison or maybe I go to one parole officer and just ask him, who can you re refer me to? And that's who I take. So that's convenient, somebody that I can get to very quickly. Systematic sampling, you choose a starting point at random and then systematically take objects at a certain number apart. For example, if there are a thousand in the population and you want a sample of 50, you would take every 20th object. Systematic samples are easier to administer than simple random samples and are usually a good approximation of a random sample. However, if there is a pattern in the population, certain types of objects could be chosen more or less often than others. Cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, the Let's go back and look at our example for uh, systematic sampling. Let's look at what we have. So if we look at our hypotheses, and this is another one you need to come up with one on your own. If you are, if you are, if we are doing a stratified sample. Okay, before I go any further, I want to make something clear. And this is maybe what some of y'all are struggling with. When you have your, your, your study and you have written your research questions and your hypotheses, that's when you would choose your sampling method. You can't necessarily use every sampling method for your hypotheses. So if you try to write or, or come up with a sampling method for a hypothesis and you realize, wait a minute, I can't use that one. That, that doesn't mean you're wrong, that just means it's not possible here. So like for instance when I asked you if you would use probability or non-probability sampling for these, you have to just choose either one and what that means, what type of sampling method would I use? Would I use a simple random sampling? Would it be better to use um, the systematic that she's talking about? So if I were to choose, if I'm going to, uh, let's see, 
let's do this one. Um, the recidivism is more likely to increase for convicted sex offenders who do not successfully complete a CBT program than those who do. I'm looking at successfully here. So I can use the Minnesota and I can add in here my if my my hypothesis were to state um, for convicted sex offenders from Minnesota who do not successfully complete. So therefore I would <clears throat> I would have to separate the sex offenders that were released into those that successfully completed and those that did not successfully complete. So I can't just randomly choose um, any sex offender that was released. So it, that would not work for this. And if I were to use a systematic, it still wouldn't work for this. I have to be able to have a sampling frame. And the difference between the simple random and the systematic is instead of just randomly choosing uh, by pulling from a hat from your sampling frame, you would pick like the 10th one or the 15th one. So you would have a system to your sampling. But in that you just randomly choose. So that's more that's the systematic way to randomly select. Okay, let's go back here to this. Sampling. In cluster sampling, the population is divided into uh, that cut it off a little bit, but she just said we're going to talk about cluster sampling. Also, too, I just realized I was I was listening back a little bit, and I apologize for this. I don't want to be confusing. I tried to um, record over it, but at one point there where it cut off real quickly, I said uh, stratified, and we were going to talk about systematic. So if there's any confusion to that, uh, we have not talked about systematic yet. I have not given you an example. Or, um, I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. I have not given you a stratified example. We've talked so far about random sampling, simple random, convenience, and systematic. Now we're going to talk about cluster and stratified. Clusters, which are then chosen at random. For example, departments of a business can be clusters or suburbs within a city. Within each cluster, all of the objects are included in the sample. Cluster sampling can be more convenient and practical than simple random sampling. However, if the clusters are different from each other with regard to the elements we are measuring, it can lead to bias or non-representativeness. There was a key right there that I want you to listen to to what she said. She said to the elements that we are studying. So within our example that we had, um, our examples here for our uh, hypotheses, cluster sampling would not be appropriate if we are only studying recidivism following programs because we're not looking at any other elements within our sample. Now, if we were looking, if we wanted to compare, uh, um, let's say, males and females, for those that were convicted sex offenders, then we could use cluster sampling because we would separate into one into males and one into females. And then we would want the same, uh, so those would be similar and bring them into our sample. But within our, what we're looking at right here, we would, this would not be appropriate. Stratified sampling. Stratified sampling seems like cluster sampling, but the strata or groups are chosen specifically to represent different characteristics within the population, such as ethnicity, location, age, or occupation. Within each group, a random sample is taken, sometimes in proportion to the size of the group. Stratified sampling can lead to a very good random representative sample. However, it can be complex to administer, and a sampling frame with considerable information about the population is required. There are other sampling methods. The five explained here give an idea of the advantages and disadvantages of various methods. You should attempt to use the sampling method that produces the best result for the resources you have available. If your sample has known bias, 
This should be taken into account in analysis and reporting. Very, very true. Remember, we already talked about that. Cancel that. Now, as I said, cluster and systematic cluster sampling would not really be appropriate for our um, hypotheses that we have here because we're not looking at any certain element within our population. Our population are already convicted sex offenders and we're already comparing those that did participate and those that did not. So we're looking at, um, it, within this, we could easily pull a uh, population from Minnesota and then from another state. So those that are not mandatory required. So now this is a little bit more detailed. So let's look at this. Let's say that within the population, we wanted to look at education level. So we wanted to, that's just another element we're going to throw into our, to our study, which makes it more difficult. Remember how we were talking about, um, you can look at those uh, different elements of a population and just add more variables because the more variables you add that you look at, you're going to reduce your error because now, now we are going to be able to say that, uh, the individual that the independent variable did impact the dependent variable and it didn't have anything to do with education or did it have to do with education so it tells us more information so let's say that uh, recidivism rates are more likely to be higher for sexual offenders without a high school degree than for those with well that tells us that we're going to look at we need to put them in uh, to a cluster and we need to systematically pull them out so that we have those that have had a high school degree and those that haven't. Now we can get a little bit more complicated and say recidivism is more likely to increase for convicted sex offenders who do not participate in any program than those who do participate and complete successfully and the amount of education will impact these results negatively. So this just it complicates what we're doing, but we still are looking at con convicted sex offenders from one area that didn't participate. So we've got to pull those out, and then we've got to pull out. We already know we can pull out that whole Minnesota because we know those did participate. But look again, I've added down here successfully. So now from that group, we've got to pull them out successfully. And we want to make sure that we are fully representing. Now, a cluster in a systematic is better for a, a little bit larger population. I wouldn't use this on a small population because most likely with this, this right here, I'm not going to come up with that many. When I'm looking at I may have 50 in one group, 75 in another, and I'm going to use those. So in a smaller sample and one that's more defined like this, I would not use these. Now I could, um, but it just, as it says, the systematic is a little bit more easier, but these are just examples and it, I, I'm trying to explain as easy as I can. Um, I just want you to be able to know when you would use a cluster sample. So I want you to think of any, any study that you would do that you would use a cluster sampling and she had a good example you know we talked about income before if we need to if we're comparing <clears throat> offense rates for those with a, with a level of income within an area well then we have to pull out those we have to separate them first into our income levels and then from each of those we would pull um, a sample just as she showed you on that video I decided to go ahead and stop there for the sampling. I think I've probably exhausted you on, on sampling as well as the other PowerPoint that uh, I did last week. I think um, looking over the test, everybody has a pretty good idea of the type of samplings to use. So I think we're done with that. So I'm going to move now into some bivariate analysis and I'll do that on the uh, the next video.